All right, well, hey, uh, good morning. Welcome to Mount Calvary. Uh, we're glad you are here. This is uh, pretty unusual for our church family uh, to be meeting like this. Thank God for the technology to do this. I'm so grateful that uh, we can create some kind of community in this way. Um, if you are a friend of mine or Stacy's or you somehow stumbled on us, we are Mount Calvary Baptist Church. We're located in Banner Elk, North Carolina. Um, we also um, have some other people who are with us today. I just want to make some really quick introductions, and these, uh, these folks will be a part of our service. I've got uh, Pastor Ben is with me today. He's our uh, student pastor, but really we call him pastor. He is uh, so much more than just ministry to students. Uh, my name is George. I've been here now since 2001 as the lead pastor. Once again, just one of the pastors. Also over here on my right, your left, is uh, Bob Cole. Bob's a member of our church, but he's a retired pastor. Uh, he served a church in New Orleans uh, for several years, and most significantly, he served in New Orleans when Katrina hit. And uh, so he has a lot of uh, he has a lot of wisdom and insight into uh, difficult days like this. And so uh, I'm so grateful for his uh, presence among us and his ministry and mentorship for me. Uh, we also have uh, Stacy Trivet is here. Stacy's our worship leader. She's going to lead us in worship here a little bit later on. She's our director and uh, minister to family and. Uh, and worship at our church, and uh, she's got her husband Sam here. I've got my wife Debbie. Evan Allen's also here. He's the chairman of our deacons. He's going to help lead us in worship, and then Bob's sweet wife Chris is also here. So just so you know, we are trying to social distance ourselves, and uh, we have hand sanitizer, and for a dollar a squirt, you can come by and get one, and you know, that's just a joke, but um, uh, we, are, we are trying to do our very best to follow the guidelines that are coming down to us. We don't know how long this is going to happen, uh, but we love our church family. Like I said, we want to try to create community, and I want to make sure that, that you remember the reason why we exist. Uh, we exist to love God and love people and to live the Great Commission. That's our mission. That's what we want to make sure we're doing. We've expressed that in a vision that we want to be the church, uh, united and empowered by the Holy Spirit to be able to take the gospel of Christ to our neighborhood, the nations, and the next generation. So. In some ways, while we're not meeting together like we normally do on a Sunday morning, uh, we are able to create a little bit of a sense of community. Maybe we're actually reaching more of our neighborhood by doing it this way. Maybe we're able to uh, reach a little bit more of the nations by doing it this way. Uh, we'll see. Um, we're certainly praying for things to return to something we might call normal in the future, but we think normal is going to look different. And I think that's going to be okay. I think the church has always responded in times of crises. I think this is where we should be shining as lights in our culture. And so I hope you'll um, take the opportunity to really pray that the Lord will uh, commission you uh, in a new kind of way to see a different kind of way to reach out to people in our community. Um, you know, it's sort of hard to keep community whenever you're isolated like this and so I think perspective is always important maybe more important now than ever before um, let me just tell you a little bit about perspective for us right now we are talking with the staff about how we can generate community when we are so distant but we also want to talk about this whole format right here this is really totally new for us unique it's really frankly strange I know I have a I have a face for radio um, but my voice isn't really great for radio, so nobody wants to look at me and not many people want to listen to me. But what we, what we understand is, is, is that this is all new for us. Uh, we'll probably make some mistakes and get this wrong uh, in how we try to do this. Uh, our, our goal, our perspective, the goal for us is, is we're not trying to make a professional production here. We just want to communicate clearly the gospel of Christ, point people to Jesus, and we want to give an opportunity for people who can't be together in community to feel like they're a part of a community in some way. And so with that in mind, a little bit later on today, um, during our, our talk in a few moments, we're actually going to be talking about a topic that may raise some questions that you have. Uh, our uh, uh, Stacy is going to have her phone ready, and if you would like to text her with uh, questions that you want to ask, uh, that's something that we don't normally get a chance to do in our Sunday morning services. So if you have a we're going to get you to send that to her. Uh, her area code is 828. Uh, then it is 898-2781. Yeah, there we go. 2781. 898-2781. Uh, area code 828. So if you have a question, write that down. Uh, we'll try to give that to you again a little bit later on. So if you'd like to uh, submit a question. Well, why don't we pray? 
and uh, we're going to get our worship service started today. One of the things we do on Sunday mornings is we have a time we call pastoral prayer, and I'm going to ask uh, Ben, if he would, to lead us in that time. Gotcha. Thanks, George. Um, as we move into our prayer time, I know that George has put our prayer list online, um, so I think you can find that on Facebook, or, and he can... Uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. For uh, Stacy, why don't you lead us in some worship? should be better. You can hear me now. Um, I do want to remind everyone that God is still in control. He was not surprised by this weird time that we're going through, and I think he's going to do amazing things through it. Um, I know we don't usually worship this way, but we need to remember that worship is not music. Worship is not coming together. Worship is telling God and reminding ourselves what he is worthy of and giving him praise and reminding us of how awesome he is. Um, we also need to remember that God, des God deserves our worship, but he doesn't need it. We need our worship. Worship reminds us of his power and his love and his grace. I'd like to share one of my favorite verses, which is Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. When we come together corporately, our worship reminds each of us of what we're going through and that we encourage each other and we teach each other and we can see what other people are going through and that they are still praising the Lord. And that is teaching and encouraging to ourselves. Now, I know that um, we're not doing real corporate worship today, um, but through the magic of the Internet, we are together in spirit and truth and through computer screen. So um, I would encourage you, I always encourage you to sing to your fullest heart's content to make a joyful noise. You may be home alone, and that what might feel great to you, or it might feel strange to you. You may be home with three or four other people. Um, no matter what your circumstance or how you feel about it, I still encourage you to sing your praises to the Lord. Our bodies and our voices were made to praise Him, and something miraculous happens. I know in me spiritually and physically when I sing praises with the body that He gave me to sing with. So. Whatever you are this morning, welcome, and I encourage you to do that. Um, because you don't, we don't have our screen with us this morning, and we didn't mail you all hymnals, uh, we picked a song that we thought everyone would know. Um, it's Amazing Grace, and we're going to sing all five verses. I know some of you are very familiar with this song, so I encourage you in your new surroundings today, maybe find something different in this song for you. Um, make this part of your prayer to start this Sunday morning.
together in this way. We pray your blessings on our time here. I pray that we share your words and what you would have us to hear. I pray on each home, Lord, that right now is tuning in or tuning into another service or having their own service and reading their Bibles and sharing with their family. Lord, no matter what is happening right now, we pray that you be glorified. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, uh, we've made a, a shift to live stream. I know this is, uh, this is unusual, but we're also going to do something a little bit different today. I suppose in the future when we have an opportunity to meet on Sunday mornings like this, we may do something that feels a little bit more like a traditional sermon. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I frankly like this kind of format uh, for this kind of moment. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a roundtable discussion. That's why I've asked Bob and Ben both to join me today. We want to talk about a particular culture that we've seen lately, uh, excuse me, a trend that we've seen in our culture. I was I was actually, uh, I really counted a lot on Bob's um, advice this week. I, I called him up knowing that he had that experience with the church in New Orleans back during Katrina. And we, we talked a little bit about some things. One of the things that he told me that was just absolutely vital to the post-Katrina ministry there was just com communication. He said that you're going to communicate and feel like you've said everything you can possibly say and you've probably only done 10% of what you ought to be doing. So... You know we're gonna we're gonna try to do every bit of communication we possibly can, but uh, but I also uh, asked him about his advice about uh, a preaching calendar, so to speak. You know about the order of what we should follow. Should we stay with what we had planned on doing, which is what we're about to do here in a few moments? We had planned this, uh, but given the circumstances, we thought maybe we ought to think about doing things a little differently. I didn't know, so I just sort of asked him in light of all the changes that have happened. You know what was his advice on? What should we do? Should we stay the course with what our plan was or should we do something different? And Bob, you know, you, you have been a real good friend to me and a, and a great blessing to our church. He leads our men's uh, Bible study on Monday mornings and, and anybody who's been a part of that just knows that this guy has uh, like knowledge and wisdom that's just coming out. With, it's just coming out in ways that you just can't hold it back in. And so I really, you know, I appreciate what you're, um, what you're saying. Um, so tell me a little bit about your thoughts about about why we, maybe we should just stay with what we had planned. Well, George, the uh, the feeling it, that people get uh, when something like this happens, when Katrina happened or when coronavirus happened, uh, one of the responses is uh, being disconnected, being uh, feeling uh, like you're no longer a part of what you once were a part of, and. Uh, for us to continue doing the things that we're doing, for us to continue, uh, for you to continue, the preaching uh, calendar that you established is a way for us to help folks feel connected, help folks feel grounded, uh, help us all to have a sense that things are going on as they need to be, and that we're not, uh, uh, that God himself has not been taken by surprise, and, uh, and that you're, uh, what you're planning to do, what you hope to do uh, as led by God has not changed. And so I think that's wise. That's what you need to do. Well, that's certainly um, that's encouraging for me. Um, last, now, last Sunday, I did preach a different message based on the emergence of coronavirus and everything that's going on. Uh, we actually put that on our uh, website. and It's also on uh, Facebook, talking about living in confidence in these days, not living in fear. We've looked at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. By the way, if God didn't give us a spirit of fear and you are afraid, where did that spirit come from? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Uh, it didn't come from God. And so um, uh, while we do want to not ignore the serious nature of what's going on, we, we don't ignore the devastation that's being uh, havoced on our world. We, we want to acknowledge that God is always in control. And so we have uh, decided we're going to stay with this. You know, we've got some pretty major events on our church calendar coming up. We, we have Easter coming up. We, we don't want to miss that no matter what uh, happens in the next uh, few weeks. We absolutely know that, uh, that, it's, that the reason why we do what we do is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If it weren't for his death, burial, and resurrection, we have no business being here. We have no reason to meet. And so we're going to stay with our Easter uh, routines as much as we can. We, we're not going to have the meetings together, but... It doesn't look like, but we'll certainly be uh, celebrating 
uh, the resurrection. Uh, also, next Sunday, let me just go ahead. It's a little bit of an announcement, a little bit of a plug for right now. Next Sunday, we're going to do communion. And once again, that's going to be the most awkward and different way maybe that you've ever done communion. We have a lot of families in our church. For you to share communion together, moms and dads with their kids, that's going to be one of the most enriching things you've ever done. Uh, I think to be able to, if you are at home by yourself, to have communion and know that others are doing communion at the same time you are is a way we can join together in community. I'll also, uh, so just be thinking about that. Get, get you, make sure you have some grape juice uh, this week. Um, have some bread, okay? Get some bread. And I know we, we use unleavened bread. There's a reason why we do that. But have some bread that you can use to break and to take next uh, Sunday uh, when we do communion. Pastor Ben will lead us in that. Uh, that'll be a, a really uh, special moment. So uh, here's, here's uh, what we plan for today. This is, this is the topic we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about apostasy. Whoa, right? Big, big topic, big words. That's the reason why I wanted these other voices to be with me on this, because we're going to talk about something that's, that's difficult to explore. It's, um, it brings a lot of emotional, uh, frankly, some emotional content to this, because when a person abandons their faith, the term that we use for that is apostasy. It's, it comes from, that word comes from a, an ancient Greek word uh, that essentially means a defiance of an established system or authority. It's a rebellion or an abandonment or a breach of faith. In the first century world, when the Greeks used that word, it was a technical term that they used for a political revolt or rebellion. And, and here's the thing, when you look around the world, just think about the days we live in now. When you look around the world today, what we are seeing more and more is uh, more people who have come out very publicly and said that what I once believed, I no longer believe. I once called myself a Christian, and now I reject the claims of Christianity. Uh, and we've, as I, frankly, I think it's a little bit of a growing trend. It's, it's uh, people who have pretty significant cultural influence and, um, and here's the thing, this, this whole live stream on Facebook thing, it's, it's new for me. And I realize that I want to be really careful about making references to other cultural institutions or individuals. We, we, I mean, I, I'm always, at least I always try to be careful. I don't want to ever come across as being angry or mad or naming names and all that kind of stuff. It's difficult. Uh, but I think it is okay to make some reference to some people who've made some pretty notable statements re uh, recently that are a matter of public record. Um, and so on my part, even though I, I want to give respect and, and honor to people as much as possible, I think we do want to be careful about making statements. And we certainly don't make judgments because that, that's the province of God. It's not our responsibility. But having said that, some very public figures lately uh, in Christianity have come out with some very public statements to Christians that they have renounced their faith. And a lot of instances, these people not only have renounced their faith, but they have made themselves apologists or defenders of the non-Christian point of view. And so they have lost their right to privacy when they do that, frankly. And uh, for instance, some of you may be familiar with a gentleman named Joshua Harris, pastor and uh, author. He wrote a best-selling Christian book several years ago called I Kissed Dating Goodbye. And, and in the book, he, he sort of outlined... Uh, a little bit of an unusual, but what he considered to be a healthy and biblical ethic for dating. Well, he um, last year announced to the world that he had excommunicated himself. He had actually said, I no longer believe Christianity. And so he has withdrawn himself from the claims of Christ and from the church. Also last year, one of the lead uh, musicians for the, uh, the uh, Christian music group, very globally influential influential collective called Hillsong. Uh, his name is Marty Sampson. He said that his faith was on shaky ground, publicly wrote that, and since that time, he has been doing a lot of things, actively blogging about what he considers to be the evil things that he finds in Christianity, and clearly he's abandoned his belief. Uh, if you have any knowledge of Christian music and Hillsong, they've been very influential in the Christian world, and it's been a huge defection for people who uh, love the Lord and who have loved their music. But perhaps... The biggest recent news for me uh, has a little bit of a, it hits closer to home for me because back in February, um, uh, the YouTube stars, Rhett and Link, um, both recorded their own one and a half hour long video podcast where they both uh, said that they had chosen to reject their belief in Christ. And I say that hits closer to home because while I don't really know those guys personally, I've met 
one of, I met Rhett one time. Um, I, I know his parents, I know his wife and her parents, uh, and, and this is devastating for, for uh, on multiple levels, not only for their family, for the people that love them and who've known them for many, many years, but, but it's devastating for a whole generation of Christians who've, who've grown up uh, hearing Rhett and Link at, for many years in their life uh, profess Christ, and now they do not profess Christ. When, uh, when Rhett and Link were in college, they, uh, they were with a ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. We call that crew now. And, uh, and they were, uh, while they were there, they actually were leaders at crew. And I've met people who went to crew during those years when they were on campus. And they'll tell you that these guys were hilarious. They were winsome. They were just fun to be around. And they regularly pointed people to Jesus Christ. And, and I, I suppose one could even surmise that in the years that they were there on the campus, that not only did they point people to Christ, but I'd say it's really possible that some people during the times they were there uh, have made authentic, real uh, professions of faith in Christ. And so this is a big deal whenever you have two guys who state they no longer believe what they grew up believing. Rhett says that he would now call himself a hopeful agnostic, and Link describes where he is as an agnostic who really wants to be hopeful. And I'm just going to tell you, it breaks my heart. Uh, I love those guys, what they've been doing. Uh, just uh, they've had a, a, a crazy amount of influence in our world. A uh, few, uh, I think last year, Forbes magazine said they were like the fifth um, highest YouTube earners. They have a following of over 5 million people and millions and more have watched some of their videos and, and uh, their influence is really significant. They've been, uh, been really connecting, especially with the younger generation. Uh, we, we have this term now, we call them social media influencers. And uh, I have no pretenses in my mind that what we are doing is going to turn me into a social media influencer. I, I, I know my audience, I know uh, what, what, what we have here, but, but if you think about it, um, these guys who have, I mean, made appearances on the Today Show and Live with Kelly and the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, these guys have an influential voice in our culture. They are social media influencers, and that means that they've been given attention by millions of people, and what they say matters, and what they believe matters. And folks, these are the days we live in. And frankly, this really shouldn't catch us off guard, because the Bible actually has something to say about this. Now, I, I probably should have said this at the beginning. For I hope you'll have your Bibles with you when we do these podcasts. If you can run and grab one uh, real quickly, do that. If you don't have one with you, maybe you can uh, pull it up on your phone or whatever. But in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, let me read what, what, Timothy, what Paul had to say to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says in verse number 1, that the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. One, some of your translations may call it doctrines of demons. Now, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything that God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Now, clearly, a little bit of a different issue was going on here in Timothy's day than what we're talking about uh, with Rhett and Link, that just by way of explanation, there were many people in the days of the early church who wanted to make salvation all about the works that they do rather than the grace and the mercy of God. And the worst of those false theologians, really, and Paul, the worst of these doctrines of demons was not just an outright rejection of the gospel, an outright rejection of Christ, but those people who would say, you need to begin with Jesus and then you've got to add a lot of yourself if you really want to know that you're a Christian. And, and so this consistent problem that we've seen all throughout history, not just in the days of Timothy, but right to this very day, right now, is that a lot of people are willing to start by talking about God and talking about Jesus, but then they end up teaching something that becomes all about man, teaching something that's really about our works, about our efforts. And so it's a kind of Christianity that, that makes everybody good. It's a kind of Christianity that, that makes us at our core, what, what J.D. Greer would say, the Disney world 
theology that if you look long enough, you're going to find goodness in everybody because we can all try to be good at some point. And so as long as you talk about Jesus, as long as you go to church and do the kind of things that Christians are expected to do, then clearly you are a Christian. Well, Paul is writing to his son in the ministry. Timothy was very, very close to Paul, very dear to him. And he says, watch out. And notice what he says. He says that you are always going to be seeing people who abandon their faith, but in the later days, that will increase. You're always going to be seeing people who teach false doctrine, but in the later days, that's going to increase. And so at this point, I want to get Ben and Bob to join me in this conversation. Um, Bob, First Timothy here gives us a picture of what apostasy is, but for emphasis and clarity, can you explain a little bit about what, how apostasy specifically shows up? Yeah, George, apostasy is, uh, uh, is a slippery slope, if you will. It usually starts out with a little bit of false doctrine, and that is you begin to believe something that's not exactly true. Uh, you begin to believe something that is maybe a partial truth, but maybe not all the way uh, followed through to the end or the, to, the, to the ultimate uh, reality that that truth leads to. And that uh, false doctrine over a period of time uh, continues to grow and continues to grow, and it can lead to a person abandoning their faith. And when we say abandoning their faith, what they're doing is they're abandoning something that they have professed to believe before this time. And so the false doctrine has led them to a place where they're influenced by the culture, they're influenced by their, their own thoughts, they're influenced by uh, influencers, if you will, uh, in the world around them. And so that false doctrine ultimately leads to abandoning the faith, mm -hmm. stepping away from what uh, you have professed that you believe. We'll, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but um, this is the reason why the, uh, the concept of faith is so important and why we regularly say here that faith is never about the person who believes, it's about what they believe. And so we, we live in a world where it's become acceptable for us to say things like, I have faith. I have faith, and it's really, a lot of times what you see is, is people who are expressing that they really believe in themselves, and they may use some really spiritual language that goes with that, but that's a false doctrine. Uh, faith is always about the object. In our case, uh, in the case of Christianity, faith is always about Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, the fact that he has power over sin, that he was the right kind of sacrifice to rescue us, and if you take any of those components out, or if you add to any of those components and make faith about what you believe, how you, how you live, then you've, uh, you, you're going to run into apostasy quickly. It may sound really Christian and spiritual early, but, uh, but it's those little seeds, those little kernels of lie that destroy truth in the end. You got anything else you want to mention regarding that? Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, it's clear that false doctrine's been with us from the very beginning, Paul was clearly addressing an issue of false doctrine. I, I thought I might just share a little bit of a historical picture of how this worked. Back in AD 318, there was a, uh, a bishop in the early church. His name was Sibelius. He tried to talk about the Trinity. And I'm going to be honest with you, talking about the Trinity is difficult because, because we're talking about God and, and how he is expressed to us. And we believe that God is one and he is three. And people are like, how can that possibly be? And Frankly, the church had to really struggle with this, especially in the early uh, life of the church in the 4th century, the 300s AD. This was a big topic early on. Well, this bishop in Alexandria, Sibelius, was trying to come up with a way to talk about God. And he said, well, God's not really three. He's just one, but he's expressed himself in different ways throughout history. Different modes was sort of the way that he used that. And, and there was a, a Christian priest. His name was Arius. And he heard how Sibelius was talking about uh, about God, and he said, that's, that's wrong, that's heresy, that's not, that's not right. And so Ar Arius took it on himself to try to combat that wrong kind of theology. And so for all of his best intentions, I think Arius went a little too far. Arius um, began to express his idea of the Trinity as, as that God is three, but, and they are similar in their essence. They're not all exactly the same. He believed that the Father was primary and the Son, since he originated from the Father, was secondary and the Spirit was... And so he sort of subordinated the Trinity, and we call that the Arian uh, heresy. The church heard what he was saying and realized that 
this is a problem. And here's, here's the thing, Bob, you were talking about just these really small little kernels of things that are not true. There were two words that, were, that this whole debate hinged on. Okay, so this is really technical, and you're going to, I love this kind of stuff. Bob, you love this kind of stuff. Um, uh, some of you are going to think this is not important at all. If we were here and you were watching us, you would see this on the screen. There were two words. One was called homoousius, and the other one was called homoousius. And the only difference between those two Greek words is this one little Greek letter. We call it the iota. It's, it's, very, a very, very, it's the I in our English language. The first word, homoousius, means they are the same in essence. And this is what the church said, that God is the three, but they are all the same in essence. The second word, which is what Arius grabbed onto, he inserted that little I there, homoousius, uh, he said that they are similar in essence. And the only difference in spelling is that one little, that one little letter. It, it, that little letter, the, the iota, a lot of times we pronounce that in our culture as iota. Have you ever heard somebody say that something doesn't matter even one iota? I mean, I mean what, what they're saying is, is that, is that the, the significance here is so tiny that it's not significant at all. I mean, the, the iota was considered to be one of the smallest determinations of value in the, Greek, in the Greek numbering system, in the lettering system. And yet that one little letter entirely changed the meaning of this word. It was at the heart of Arius' false teaching. And it was so important for the church to deal with this, they called one of the most important conferences in the history of the church in AD 325. They called what was called the First Council of Nicaea. And they came together to talk about this because here's the thing. While Arius... Was a, he, he didn't have the same kind of influence that the bishop of Alexandria had. He, Arius was just a priest. Arius was incredibly popular. He was a very winsome and clever Bible teacher. He did music. He even set some of his theology to music. And people were beginning to follow him by the scores. And the, I mean, it was just his theology was just making its way all throughout Christianity. If, if he lived today, you would say that Arius was a media influencer. That's what he would have been. He would have been the guy who actually influenced culture with his thinking because of his winsome nature. And so because he was so clever, because people were, were um, following his teaching, they called this conference, this council, AD 325. It's when they came up with what we call the Nicene Creed that talks about God being eternally one, and yet he is three persons, distinct and same in essence. All three are the same. Once again, talking about the Trinity is difficult. I get that. But let me just say that Jesus, you have to understand the Trinity, at least to this point, if you really want to understand your salvation, because you are saved in Jesus Christ, not just some kind of idea. You are saved in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. So God is one. He is three in person, Father, Son, and Spirit. So I wanted us to talk a little bit about apostasy today, because this false doctrine stuff has been with us forever. But this is really serious. Uh, we have to be careful what we believe and who we believe. And we live in a day when it is so easy for people to have significant, really way more influence in the culture than they rightly deserve. And when we have cultural influences and influencers shaping what we believe, then, then I think it's important for us as a church to address these things. Let me just give you one more scripture, and then I'm going to get Bob and Ben to be way more active involved in this. But if you, if you, there's, a, there's one of the shortest books in the Bible. Um, it's the book of Jude in your New Testament right there before Revelation. It's only one chapter, and so when we talk about Jude, we'll say Jude 3 and 4. That's Jude verses 3 and 4. There's only one chapter. But in verse number 3, Jude writes this. He says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share... I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation uh, was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God uh, into a license for immorality and they deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. If you want to read a really sobering book of the Bible, read Jude's letter, because that letter deals with apostasy from beginning to end, and it just talks about the kinds of signs of things that happen in the lives of those who are apostate. Uh, the, the concept of immorality is really huge. There's so many other things that you'll see, but the word that I want you to focus in on in those verses that we read there in Jude, verse 3, was is that we should contend 
for the faith. Once again, in the original language, Greek word there, it's a compound verb form. It's the same word that we use and translate today into the word agonize. It implies a continuous struggle and something that is so, uh, so deep and visceral for us that we literally agonize. It's the same kind of word that we might use to describe when Jesus was in the Garden of, of Gethsemane as he was praying, he was agonizing in prayer uh, before he was crucified. So that's the idea here. And so these, these words that, that Jude give us here are going to be a constant reminder to us that as Christians, we must contend, we must agonize over being clear in what we believe and what the faith is that God has given to us and that Christians should take this really, really serious. And so, uh, and, and what Jude does here, is this is a letter to the church. It's not just a letter to church leaders. This is a letter to the church that we are in a fight and that all believers should sharpen their discernment skills so they can recognize when false doctrine comes their way, when teaching that is not real comes their way. And one of the things that I see, and it's part of the reason why maybe there is a rise in apostasy today, is because Christians are so undiscerning now. And somebody will come up with a latest, greatest book or some kind of teaching that everybody just jumps on the bandwagon and, and it's not long before you discover that that teacher really is teaching heresy and, and we just, we just we, we soak it in. And, and for some people, it forever leads them away from the truth. Now, there's a lot of other things that I could say right now. And those of you who do come to Mount Calvary on a regular basis know that normally I say a whole lot more. Um, but I wanted to get these other voices here in here. Um, uh, before we get into this round table, let me just remind you again, if you have a question and you want to submit it, uh, I can't promise you that we'll get to every single question. Uh, we already have a few that have been uh, submitted. Uh, but, but if you'd like to ask a question, yeah, I'm going to ask you to send it to Stacy. Her telephone number, text it to her. Her telephone number is area code 828-898-2781. Okay, so if you'll text it to Stacy here in a few minutes, she'll write those questions down. Uh, like I said, we may or may not be able to get to all of them. We, we're going to try to keep our time, be finished by the top of the hour. So let's just dive in. Um, there's a lot of things we could talk about. Ben, I want to start with you here. Would you, would you just sort of give us a little bit of a, a rationale for why this is a relevant discussion? I mean, we're a small church. I'm just going to tell you. Mount Calvary, we're, we're not a big church. We know this. Um, and our influence is, is what it is. We, we get that. But this is a relevant discussion, I think, for large churches, small churches, for all Christians. And can you talk a little bit about why that would be the case um, as we think about this? Yeah, thanks, George. Um, well, I think no matter where you live or how big your social circle is, um, statistics new and old show that parents are still the largest influence on their families and on their kids. Um, and fathers especially, they show that. But uh, with that in mind, still, um, technology more than ever um, makes it possible that we have this supposed peer connection um, larger than we've ever had before. Um, a greater number of influences that come in. So even like in this time where most of us are at home with our families, uh, back when I was a kid, it would be just there at the house. We might have some movies to watch or some books to read or whatever, but we didn't have, uh, we couldn't go online and just watch and see what the world is doing or what everybody else is doing or hearing personal opinions. It was either the news um, or nothing. And so now um, all of us, we have this large group of, uh, of people and this large uh, input coming from everywhere. And so um, what I would interject and kind of my encouragement to us and families is that um, it's very important for us as believers uh, to live out and demonstrate the, reali the reality of a healthy, active um, spiritual life, a life of worship. And, uh, and so I want to bring that up in, in three areas and they kind of, they kind of mix in, but um, what I've seen, I think, over the years of being in camp ministry and then here at church um, is that some of the hardest groups to reach or some of the folks that had the most difficult time were um, kids whose parents went to church or were just attending church or they, as you know, we've mentioned, they would say that, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but there was no real activity. There was no real in-depth study. They didn't... Um, didn't talk about it. They weren't super involved. They just kind of attended. And um, they were the ones that it was a little bit easier to uh, kind of walk away from, um, from what they said that they held on to, but it didn't really have a, a, a real bearing in their lives or impact or change um, how they really lived and that sort of thing. And so our words need to match up um, our actions. 
And, um, and so a lot of, I think, uh, for us as, as Christians and in this time where we, it seems to be so rampant that people are just walking away from their faith is um, that I think you know, we would say actions speak louder than words or the lack of actions. And so there needs to be a, a genuine, um, you know, our words and actions mm-hmm. need to be, there needs to be a depth of that, especially for us parents who are influencing our kids and they're watching us and they're seeing the way we act and how we really live out what we say we believe. And so it's important <laughs> no matter where we're at or yeah, what size. I think that's a, that's a huge uh, comment too. And, and, and because, you know, once again, it's easy for us, if we're not careful, we can get such a critical and judgmental spirit. And so we have, to, and so every child has to make their own decision. But I think you, you see a correlation between children who actually see their parents living something genuine and parents who aren't living something genuine. I think that's an important point. Um, Bob, you know, when we talk about apostasy, we, we're, actually, we're actually talking about people who had an overt witness of faith. I think it'd be wrong to name somebody an apostate who never even believed in the first place. I, I've, I've, got a, I've got friends who have grown up the circle of faith, never went to church. I got, I got one buddy who never went to church in his whole life, and he was afraid that there was a, there was a wedding that I was going to be doing of a mutual friend. He was afraid we were going to do it at the church because he would have to go in the church, and he'd never done that his whole life. And he was sort of like relieved whenever we said it was going to be an outdoor wedding. And, and so here, here's the thing is that there are, there are people who grow up out, and, and I don't think we can rightly call that person uh, an apostate. But when someone does profess Jesus Christ, it feels like to a lot of us that they have lost their salvation. Why don't you take a moment to, to talk about that? Yeah, the idea of losing your salvation is, uh, is very tempting when someone uh, that we have believed is a believer uh, walks away from the faith. Uh, I'm sure those folks who found value in the ministry of Rhett and Link uh, are devastated. They, they don't understand what's happened and they are tempted to feel like uh, Rhett and Link may have lost their salvation. The truth is, uh, according to the Bible, uh, we cannot lose our salvation. Uh, John 3.16 says, whoever believes in Jesus will be saved and will have eternal life. It's not eternal life if you can take it away. So there is not, uh, there is not the opportunity for those of us who are real believers to walk away from the faith. There are those who, uh, and Jesus taught about these folks, and I'll, I'll say the name in a minute and you'll understand what I'm talking about. There are folks among us who, are, who look very much like we look, who sound and know what to say, uh, who are uh, working, uh, it appears, for the kingdom, and, and who make uh, contributions, uh, it appears, in the kingdom. What Jesus taught about was wheat, and we used to say tares. I'm grateful to the modern translations that say weeds. I never knew what a tear was to start with. Uh, But there are wheat and there are weeds in the church. And Jesus advised uh, at the end of his parable that we not try to separate the wheat from the weeds. And I've talked about that a lot of times over the years, and I've heard other people talk about it, and sometimes we say you don't want to pull up the, the weeds because the, the uh, roots of the weeds might be tangled up with the roots of the, the, uh, 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 the real wheat, and uh, you might damage the wheat when you pull up the, the weeds. I'm not so sure that's what that means. I think what Jesus might mean is that you and I don't have the ability you and I are unable to see the heart uh, and understand the inner workings of what's going on in a person. We don't know their relationship between the relationship that exists between that individual and the Lord. We can't know it. Uh, only God knows really what's in each of our hearts. And so is it possible for a person to step away from the faith? I believe the Bible says, no, it's not possible. Is it possible that people are among us as uh, acting as believers uh, who are not believers? I think Jesus made it clear that those folks are among us. And I suspect that that is what, uh, what's happened uh, when we see apostasy. I think, um, 
actually one of the questions. Stacy, why don't you read some of, uh, we have a question that was submitted, question number one that you've got there. I think that might be relevant to this at this point. Okay, it says, when we see all the things happening around us, do you believe these are signs of the end of days? Okay, so I guess I was thinking of question number two probably. It's always shocking when I read about Christians renouncing their faith. Do you believe there are warning signs we can be looking out okay, for? Yeah. yeah, the warning signs. I remember seeing that. Uh, so, so the question is, and ben, Ben's going to talk about this here in just a few minutes when we, when we get close to the end. Um, but the one thing that I would like to say is, is, is sort of going back to that Disney World theology that J.D. Greer, I don't know if he coined that, but I heard him use that. So I, I've been using it a bunch as well. But um, I think one of the dangers that we're seeing is, is that we have trained people to be good little boys and girls in church. And, and, and we want our children to be good little boys and girls. There's nothing wrong with raising good little boys and girls. But what we have done by training them the way we have, I feel like that we have, we have trained people to, to care more about the praise and the audience of men than we have the audience of God. And so I think when we see people giving up what they have always said was Christianity, my, my, to me the warning sign would be somebody who is overly uh, passionate about, about the praise and the applause of men and who don't seem to be really caring much about the praise and applause of God. I think that's a warning sign. I think it's a warning sign when, when somebody knows how to spout out, spout off the terminology of faith in Christianity, and yet they don't seem to have any kind of real life transformation going on in their hearts. And I think what we're seeing when you get guys like Rhett and Link and others who give up this facade of Christianity is to me what it feels like is, is they all of a sudden have this weight that's lifted off their shoulders. It's like the burden of trying to maintain the appearance is no longer there. And, and so I think to me, what, what Jesus said was, is he says, come to me, all you who are, who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I, I, think, I think one of the real keys of, of effective and, and, and just life-changing Christian life is, is, to, is to really have a sense of confidence and relaxing in the Lord. And I'm, I'm afraid that, that we've had a Christianity in America for a long time that's focused so much on the behavior, so much on making ourselves look exactly like we ought to look, that, that, that a, a child who is young and got baptized at an early age and, and who has sort of grown up under the constraints of this, this system, it's liberating for them to say, ah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna cast all that off. And in light of all the things that are going on in the culture, it's so much easier to fall in with what's so socially acceptable in our world anyway. And so, you know, I, really my heart breaks for Red and Link, but I think they are probably happier now than they've been in a long time because I think they finally have just released themselves from the burden of trying to make themselves acceptable to God. Any other thoughts about that? I mean, is that, does that seem to track well? I mean, it, so, so, Bob, here's a question then. Is, is there's a term that we use a lot of times in Christianity about Christians who are backsliders. Do you, do you even like that term? I mean, does that term work? And, and I mean, how would we do that? Yeah, there's a, there's a big distinction between apostasy and backsliding. Mm -hmm. And I'll make that distinction first. Backsliding is what a Christian, uh, a real Christian would do uh, when they uh, fall back into a pattern of sin or sins that, uh, that they have committed in the past. It is uh, something that will not prevent their ultimate salvation. Uh, they have been saved by God. It is not their behavior that's going to get them to heaven. It is the grace of God to start with. And so their backsliding uh, will not prevent their salvation. But it's a firehouse kind of salvation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's the kind of salvation that uh, allows us to go on living however we want to live. I really appreciated the Jude passage that you read uh, because Jude said that we are to contend for the faith and you talked about agonizing over it. Every great general in history has understood something about armies and, and we are an army. We are the army of Christ. We live in a, we occupy territory in a, in a, uh, in a dangerous place in the enemy's camp. Uh, Here's what the general always knows that's going to be successful. You cannot be still. You must not let your army be content with where they are. Any army that's going to win is going to advance. You must make advances. And so 
How do we translate that into our faith? How do we translate that into the kind of life that we live? The New Testament tells us in a lot of places to stand. And when we preach about it, when we teach about it, we talk about that being a military term. And it pictures someone taking a stance from which he cannot easily be dislodged. Someone leaned forward into the battle, someone whose balance is, is secure. And that's a good picture for us at times. But Paul also says that he's gonna forget what's in the past and he's gonna look forward and strive. He's gonna to, he's going to work toward that upward calling in Christ Jesus. He knows that God has something for him and that he is to work for it. Mm. That's, that's the picture uh, that our General Paul wants you and I to understand. We are to be advancing, not backsliding. And yeah, so, that's why Paul told Timothy to continue in the things that you've learned. I mean, and then take these things and commit those to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Um, we're going to be running out of time here in a minute. Um, Stacy, you might have another question that came here. Well, if you do, let me know here in a second. But there's one other final thing that I, uh, one of the things that Ben, I, I have heard Ben talk about on more occasions than I can recall um, as he ministers with the young people is, is he talks about the examined life, uh, you know, sometimes in a little bit of a different context. But tell me a little bit about your thoughts on what it means for us to be really searching in our life and searching our hearts on that. Gotcha. And this kind of follows up with the first question and the answer that families are important and that parents, we have a great responsibility to live out, um, you know, a genuine faith in our, in our words and our actions. But as you mentioned, um, it is the, we all have our own um, responsibility to, you know, each, we, we have to make our decision. Um, and so the examined life, I have three areas that have kind of, that I've seen and really that that I kind of fall into. And so I want to share a personal story and I'll, I know we got to hurry, but quickly, and I don't want to throw my uh, parents under the bus. So I have some good news, <laughs> bad news. Um, so the good news is my parents got back together and it was amazing. It's a really neat story. But when I was a senior in high school, my parents split up and uh, they were apart for several years. And so when I was growing up, it was my parents, they did what they were supposed to do. They taught me, Hey, this is right and wrong. This is what we believe as a family. This is why we go to church. Um, this is what Christianity is, this is what marriage is, all the things, they, they taught me these things. But when my parents split up, all of those things that had been kind of the foundation that I'd stood on, um, it, it crumbled and it fell apart. And what I realized as a senior in high school and what you were talking about earlier, that we have a responsibility to make these decisions, is I'd been lazy. And so I'd let the church, I'd let my parents, I'd let other books and things, I'd let them teach me um, in a way, in a limited way that they could, because it's only limited, but I hadn't searched for myself. And I hadn't really gone after who is God in my life? Who is Jesus? Um, and then how, what is that going to mean for me personally? And so I, I'm thankful that in that time it was very painful, but I, I'm, I'm thankful to the Holy Spirit that I was drawn to seek God, where I've known some folks that the opposite happened. And that was their they made a decision to reject all of that. You know, it didn't work for my parents or, you know, didn't help in this situation. And I know the temptation, because I've had it too, that when bad things happen, we can kind of use that as a, a way to step away. Um, and it would, I think it would have been easy for me at that time because what I was going to step away from was nothing that I'd really invested in. Mm -hmm. And it's just been something I'd grown up with. So I think that the first thing that we need to examine is what have we just learned and what have we learned to take for granted? This has been a part of our lives. And then another thing that's a temptation in my life is I think that um, we don't examine that our relationship with God is pretty one-sided or selfish. And what I mean by that is um, we know that in our personal relationships, let's say that my wife Liz, if I only talked to Liz or whatever or spent time with her was on Wednesdays or Sundays, you know, our relationship would not be good at all. It wouldn't be deep, you know, it wouldn't, you know, if I'm like, hey, I'll talk to you next week on Sunday, you know, how long would our relationship last? Um, but yet we illogically, you know, I, I hear people say, you know what, I just don't feel God or I don't see God working or he's not real to me. And then when we investigate further, I ask them like, you know, how much time do you spend in the word or how much time do you spend in prayer? You know, or how much time do you spend involved with other believers? They're usually like, not much, you know, not much time. And so I, I think if we know that our personal relationships wouldn't work or be healthy or be deep, if we didn't spend that time, then why do we expect to feel God or to sense his presence if we're not invested mm. and involved? And so I think the second area is examine, is our relationship with God one-sided, you know, or are we treating God as like kind of magic, really, 
or you know, we talk about the vending machine. You know, we're constantly like trying to say the right words or do the right things just so we can get what we want. And that kind of goes into my third point that I see as a temptation for us is that we really just want to do what we want to do and to feel safe. Sometimes we just add Jesus. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then we feel like, okay, well, my life is all right because I've got some Jesus in there. But then when it comes down to really, we have a whole group of people around us and they're, they're dropping out and they don't even care about the adding Jesus anymore then it's easy, I think, if we've not invested or if God is not a part of who we really are, then we can step away and walk away, and it's easier and easier to do that. Mm. And so that kind of leads me to one scripture. I just want to read, um, I want to read Proverbs um, 30. Um, I'm going to read verses 8 through 9 because uh, I do, this isn't a new thing, um, this idea of people stepping away from their faith. I mean, this has just been a, an issue that humans have dealt with. And even in Proverbs, he says, the writer here in verse 8 says, um, he's talking about these two things that I asked the Lord to, to give me before I die. He says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. But then he says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Wow, I think that's a, a great verse. I think... It, We've got other things that we could talk about just for sake of time. I'm going to bring it to a, a close here. But, but is it possible that the age of coronavirus is upon us so that we can actually pare down our lives in a way that reminds us what's most important? The writer of Proverbs here essentially said, Lord, don't bless me with anything that takes my heart away from you. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we're living in those kind of days. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this. I want to close with um, just something real quickly. Um, I, if you've never looked on the internet and found a website called the Gospel Coalition, let me commend that to you. The Gospel Coalition, you'll find that if you search it. Great um, website that deals with a lot of cultural issues and theology and just lots of, just the whole gamut of Christian experience. Uh, from a gospel center perspective, I was reading this week, uh, well, actually a couple weeks ago, an article by a guy named Eric Raymond. The title of the article was What Apostates do not say. And he made a really good point about this whole discussion that when people walk away from Christianity, they give all kinds of reasons for that. They say the church failed them, Christians failed them, they're struggling with faith and science, they're dealing with the cultural changes in our world that, that just don't line up, uh, they, they, their thoughts don't line up anymore with what the Bible teaches. And so, you know, from the whole gamut of you know, sexual purity and relationships and all the things that are happening in the world, they're like, you know, I just don't believe the same things the way I used to be. And it's hard in a culture that everybody's pushing against the fences and trying to expand what is real. And, and, and as Paul wrote to Timothy, that they end up becoming hypocritical liars in the, at the, in the long run. And so you, you live in a world like this, and it's just easy to, when people who do give up the faith, they complain about all that stuff. But, but Raymond said this. He said, there's one thing that I don't hear an apostate say, and this should get our attention. They don't say much about Jesus. We don't hear people saying that Jesus was dishonorable. We don't hear people saying that he was unfaithful or that he was a fraud or that he wasn't good or that he was unloving or that he wasn't sacrificial in his service. We don't hear people saying that Jesus didn't exist and that he didn't captivate the imagines of his culture. We don't hear people saying that Jesus let them down, and we don't hear stories of people saying that Jesus isn't what they wanted. In fact, the truth is, people don't often turn away from the faith and talk much about Jesus at all. He's neither impugned nor discredited. And I'd like to leave you with this great quote from Eric Raymond. He said this, that the road to apostasy is paved with indifference to the glory of Christ. And I think this is one of the problems that we're facing uh, in our world today is, is we've un unintentionally and for all maybe uh, altruistic or good reasons, sometimes the church has focused so much on changing the culture when it's not our responsibility to change the culture. It's Jesus who changes the culture. It's Jesus who changes lives. And we really, this is a good time for us to refocus our thoughts because people don't need to, to hear about what the church is. They need to hear about who Jesus is. And the church that's focused on Jesus will be the church that it ought to be in this culture. Uh, once again, that road to apostasy, it's paved with indifference to the glory of Christ. Our salvation depends completely on Jesus. And let me just say this, because I know we're over our time. 
But if there's somebody who's listening to us right now and this talk has been like enlightening, encouraging, but maybe it's brought questions in your own heart and mind about what your faith really is, whether or not you really truly are a Christian. If you need to have a conversation, we would love to talk to you about that. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, him alone, his death, burial, and resurrection uh, for your salvation, I'm going to encourage you to do that. I'm going to pray in just a moment and actually give you an opportunity to do that. Uh, the Apostle Paul was going to a, a city called Corinth. We have a couple letters in the Bible that he wrote to that church at Corinth, the Corinthian letters. In that first letter, he said that when he went to Corinth, that first time he went to Corinth, he said that I went there and I was very, very careful about what I had to say when I got there. Because see, Corinth was like a cultural center of the world. It was a center of philosophy. It was a trade. Uh, there was lots of commerce coming through. It was a wealthy city. It had all the advantages. In a lot of ways, you could say Corinth is America in a lot of ways. Corinth was, was just a happening place. And, and Paul knew that he, I mean, he was one of the most brilliant minds of his day. And he knew that he could come in there and he could argue philosophy with the best of them. But here's what he wrote to the Corinthian church. He said, when I came, I purposed in my heart to only know one thing, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul could have talked about philosophy with those guys, but instead he talked about Jesus and why Jesus came and why we need him for our salvation. So if that's a foreign concept to you, I want to pray. Um, I'd love to invite you to, to trust that Jesus Christ is uh, the Son of God, that he is equal to God in his essence, but that he's the Son of God who came and took our place on an old rugged cross, as we like to say. He did that not because he deserved to die, but because we deserve to die. We are not good people. And if it weren't for Jesus coming and dying on the cross for our sins, we would have to be responsible for ourselves. But Jesus said, no, I'm doing this as a substitute for you. And so if you have never put your faith in Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that right now. I want to encourage our church family to be praying for people who are struggling right now and wondering what's truth and what's real. And, uh, and we want to give our church family an opportunity to continue in community as we, poke, as we focus on the Lord himself. Okay, so let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come together in this way. We're going to sing another song that focuses on the glory of Christ. We want to praise you, Jesus. Thank you. Lord, maybe there's somebody who's watching today who is not a Christian or they have serious concerns about their faith. And maybe in this moment, what needs to happen is, is that they would just honestly and humbly before you confess that they are a sinner, that, that they have, have uh, walked far from you and they know that your love has extended right there into their house, into their living room, wherever they're sitting right now watching this. Uh, they realize you love them and that Jesus committed himself on their behalf to die to be buried and to raise again from the dead. He did that to take the punishment of our sin that we deserve. He took it in his body. He physically bore that uh, to the cross. Uh, and then when he rose in power, Lord, he conquered sin. He conquered death forever. So you, you invite us to believe. You, you invite us to believe this truth that the reality of your provision for us is sufficient. Lord, uh, your grace for us is also sufficient. I pray for our church family that you would just bless them today. Uh, help them to know that you are with them. Lord, help us to give glory and honor to you. We lift you up. And so now, Lord, we sing uh, this song as a way to close our time of worship uh, and glorify your name. Yeah. 
cases, our hearts break when we think about apostasy, when we think about those who have come close to you but have not latched on. Lord, we pray uh, that that will not happen uh, to those around us, to those dear to us and near to us. Father, I pray that we will all come to understand what a glorious thing it is to have Jesus to watch us and to care for us, to provide what we need, to love us, to ensure our future, to give us a hope that is glorious beyond our understanding right now. And so, Lord, I just pray that our hearts open up to you uh, in these days. The Lord has put our lives on pause and in this pause, we have opportunity to spend time with him, to be done with the frothing that life usually is in our day, and just to sit and be still in the presence of the Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that as we do that, as we share in this time together, that we will share you with those around us. We ask all that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.